oh, by the way, uh, FYI, there's uh, flooding in, uh, Nerv in Manila, they said. And too little food, no? Kasi because of climate change, there were, there were no vegetation. By the way, some says that uh, there are carnivorous, but around uh, 65% of dinosaurs, they are, or they were, herbivores. Ayan, 35% carnivorous. They said they have too much food. Ayan, diet. <laughs> the real reason that dinosaurs became extinct. And maybe food poisoning from poisonous grasses or herbs or trees during their time. And others says uh, tectonism or volcanism could be the possible reason why they became extinct. For Christians, specifically uh, us, we uh, tried to see whether the global flood no? right? um, could be the a possible explanation, a plausible explanation of their demise. No? But we cannot just say that it's due to flood. Because some people, they don't believe in the Bible. And you say, oh, this is the Bible. <laughs> I don't know that. I believe in other uh, references. All right, so you must back up your information with the data. Ayan. So this is our uh, place there in Wyoming. So the project is the Dino Dig Project, a taphonomic tha study. So the objective is to learn more about the dinosaurs and how they might fit into our understanding of the history of the planet while communicating our beliefs about Earth history to our students and teachers as well. So what is taphonomy? Maybe it's uh, new to you, to some. It's the study of everything that happens from the time when an organism is alive until it is excavated. So you're just tracing, parang history siya. All right, natural history. So this is the Hanson Ranch, all right? Actually, Hanson Ranch, uh, the, owner, the owners of that ranch, they are not Adventists. But when they found out that there are some, you know, uh, valuable fossils there, they look for um, scientists who could dig those dinosaur bones and they want those scientists that can, you know, uh, can be trusted because it's valuable, ito, eh. oh, very valuable. So uh, they contacted you know, a lot of researchers but uh, ultimately they found uh, the group of Dr. Art Chadwick no? from Southwestern Adventist University. So these are the uh, collaborators, all right? as well as the volunteers. That's the Hanson Ranch. It's located somewhere here you know, in Wyoming, USA. So uh, these were the group that I joined during that time. So we have a lot. And by the way, it's not, when you are there, you must be uh, more or less relatively physically fit. Because what you got to do is from the morning after, after, until afternoon, you have just to dig. Oh. And then when you are there, they will just give you a sandwich for lunch. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's, a, it's a hard work, you know, you will dig from the morning until afternoon, and during that summer, ang afternoon nila hindi hanggang 5 or 6 p.m., it will last up to 10 p.m., ang kanilang sunset is 10 p.m., <laughs> All right. but at, at, at 4 or 5, we pack up na naman. All right, Sige. so this is the Hanson Ranch Station uh, from 100 feet, you know, so we have our tents there, All right. and the uh, weather there is quite uh, um, erratic. No? In the morning, it will rain. Uh, in the uh, noontime, it's quite hot. All right? Maybe uh, more than, all right, let's say 30, 33 degrees centigrade. Then in the morning, it will drop to negative 1 or negative 2, <laughs> something like that. So it's quite hard. No? Then, uh, of course, they have flora there as well as fauna. Right. You could see these flowers when you go there, no? If you are interested, no? They're looking for you. All right. So these are the areas that below there, there's a lot of dinosaur bones. And you can also go up if you like, all right? No? To dig those dinosaur bones. So it's a mudstone formation as well as sandstone formation. And when you look at the uh, area, you could see some traces of, uh, let's say, water movement. Uh-uh. So it's just like that. It seems that uh, there was, you know, those current during that time, no? In that part of Wyoming. And so you could see that yellow line, no? 
So this could be a possible, um, I mean, information or fact that will point to a flood. No? So we have different sites there, site one, site two, site three, up to eight. No? The other would be on the other side. No? And from this one, this is our camp, and going there, maybe you have to walk 30 minutes, no? but then we have also the, uh, you know, the vehicle going there. Right. So uh, this is the tent no? that uh, you have to pitch during the time. And uh, the good thing there, we start early. No? We have worship time as well as uh, in the morning as well as in the evening. All right. So we have worship. Then in the quarry, uh, we have to dig. And uh, speaking of digging, they will uh, teach you also how to properly dig. You know? Because it's not uh, you just excavate and so on and so forth. No? The, the fossils are quite uh, fragile. Fragile sila. Ma mahina na. All right? So you must have those uh, skills. Ayan. And this is the dinosaur bone. And by the way, we are also permitted to bring some. <laughs> so I have some in AUP. All right? But those are dinosaur bones that are only small. No? Ayan. So uh, these are some of the bones that... Uh, uh, were excavated. No? You could see the vertebral column. All right? And when you have like that, it's quite fragile kasi hindi pwedeng isa-isahin. No? You have to get it as a uh, hole. No? So you have to put some fixative. This is the jaw, no? if I'm not mistaken, no? with the teeth. Ayan, this is a uh, metatarsal. No? If you have your foot, parang mahabang bone doon. Ayan, that's the metatarsal of a dinosaur. Ayan. Later on, I think it was identified as Edmontosaurus dinosaur. Ayan. After that, since it's fragile, we have to put a uh, uh, plaster no? so that it will not uh, break Ayan. and transfer that from Wyoming to Texas. So it's around 24-hour uh, travel. Ayan. See, this is uh, Dr. Kit Snyder, the chair of the uh, biology department of South Advent Southern Adventist University. <laughs> Nag joke lang kami dyan. <laughs> but this is the rib no? of a, a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is a part of Triceratops no? that was dig there in that uh, Atula 2 area. And this is the process of uh, um, fixing them so that they will not. Uh, uh, you know, they will uh, be still intact when you reach uh, Texas from Wyoming because it's a one-day travel. And in the laboratory, you can now uh, get the uh, plaster, then you have to fix no, the bone. All right. <clears throat> and there are uh, a few uh, processes that you will do in order to uh, put that bone, no? To the proper place. No? Hindi pwedeng, uh, you have still a lot of, uh, let's say, soil and so on and so forth, so you have to clean that. No? And of course, you have to wear a mask. All right. So these uh, were the bones that were excavated during that time. And after that, it, they, the researchers will take pictures, uh, 360 degrees, and save that in the database. So if you're interested, you can visit the uh, Southwestern Adventist University uh, database and the uh, excavated uh, bones were now uh, uh, are, the, are there then they have these specific databases no? Ayan. so you can actually see the 360 degrees uh, picture of the bones Ayan. so uh, f uh, for uh, actually uh, I've excavated um, not too many, but these are some of the representatives of the dinosaur bones that I excavated no? or cleaned during that area. So this is the sample no, of a uh, jaw of a dinosaur. Then you can uh, tilt it 360 degrees no? using your computer. And so you can study even though you are off-site. And they model no, the excavated bones and they found out that it just uh, looked like this, no? That is in 1999, then in 2000, in 2001, 2002, 2003, 
and so on. No? So those are the bones that uh, were excavated by the project, uh, headed by uh, Dr. Art. Now it's uh, Dr. Wood no? who um, uh, heads the project. So what are the important uh, facts or information that uh, we've got there? Bones occur in normally graded bed, something sorting by bone type. So, yun ang nakita nila. It seems like uh, they are sorted, no? Just like this, no? So, you can think of possible reasons why it seems that they are sorted out, no? So, they are also having this horizontal distribution, right? As well as vertical distribution. Another one, bones are very well preserved with little evidence of weathering or abrasion. So, what can you expect with that? It means there is a rapid no? Deposition. No? Kasi pag hindi rapid, it will decay through time. Diba? So you, you can see these uh, bones. And um, how many animals are there in that place? They are, we are expecting that it's around the 5,000 to as many as 25,000 animals in that area. It's quite many. So these are the bones that were excavated and identified no? in a 165 meters squared. No? from scapulae up to vertebrae and different parts of the animals. So the future plants, there is still a lot in that area, no? not yet excavated, and this is the projected bones that uh, are scattered there. So still a lot of work to do. So what are the lessons and insights? Dinosaurs, uh, they were crossing the river at flood stage. That's one uh, possible hypothesis. Now, when they cross, then uh, flooding occur, then they were drowned and sweep downstream. Kasi parang naipon sila. Parang naipon sila, ayan. In that area. Uh, yeah, by the way, that site, there is also a current uh, river. Mayroon pa rin dun, um, sa area na yun. Year after year, this happened, perhaps during the annual migration, resulting in accumulation of massive bone bed with ten of thousands of animals. Ayan. So these are the points that uh, teacher as well as uh, educators must know first. We should accept that dinosaurs did exist for a period of time on earth and that in certain places they seem to be numerous. So that's a fact. No? We can see a lot of fossils. Second, skeletons found in museums are typically not the actual bones. They are replicas. No? But there are actual bones that are tinatago sa safe place no? because these are valuable and delicate. If you visited the Museum of Natural History no, in Manila, it's a replica. replica. No? Right. But there are also actual bones. Actual bones are stored in an ideal place so that it will not easily decay. Third, the unearthed bones, uh, there are parts, but they are also nearly complete or articulated such as the T-Rex in Chicago Field Museum. And then, after some time, dinosaurs disappeared and they were found in layers of sedimentary rocks, their bones, their fossils. And uh, based on the uh, layers, you could find dinosaurs at the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. That Wyoming site is a Cretaceous uh, site. No? Aside from dinosaur, you can also uh, you can also find mollusks, reptiles, fish, okay, microscopic organisms such as diatoms and algae. Uh, so what can you expect there? So if there are some marine organisms there, it means that there, uh, formerly it could be that uh, there was an ocean there, something like that, because there are marine organisms. Not only freshwater, but you can also uh, find freshwater organisms there. So there's a lot of numerous hypotheses, no? But, of course, we have to base our belief or our, um, our um, inclination uh, with the scientific information. Fifth, most creationist scientists believe that dinosaurs disappeared together with other species during the worldwide flood described in the book of Genesis. And maybe during that time, there, um, there were also gigantic tsunamis, volcanic activity, uh, a lot of carbon dioxide, sulfides, and other chemicals that are harmful to living system. Genesis 1, it says there, God will created sea life as well as birds on the fifth day and the rest of the animals on the sixth days. 
So, in the Bible, there's no specific name there as dinosaur. No? And there are also others like beetles, sharks, starfish, algae, and other organisms that were not specifically indicate, indicated in the Bible. Number seven, dinosaurs require careful and rigorous study, something Christians with interest and talent should be encouraged to do. Ayan. So, uh, because uh, there's also a connection no, sa ating faith and science. And dinosaurs do not challenge or compromise our faith in the Bible's, Bible's teaching. And so that's one of the conclusion. So uh, I can see that these dinosaurs are, you know, they're quite massive, but they're also small ones. So for our uh, Christian faith, we must be strong also, as well as our relationship, as well as faith in God. So for resources, you can visit the Geoscience Research Institute. You just type. No, and you could find a lot of information. We have also resource centers no, in Bolivia, in Mexico, in Ayas, we have one. And also, of course, we have an AUP. And we're still uh, collecting, no, but uh, through the help of our SSD, no, uh, we have some uh, fossils. Na doon. So um, we have also this uh, database of dinosaurs at the Southwestern Adventist University, and you could find a lot of bones there, and you can study if you like. No? And of course, Dr. Art Chadwick, uh, he published this uh, book on faith, reason, and Earth's history with Leonard Brand from LLU. And Dr. Leonard Brand, a very nice guy also. So that, uh, that ends my presentation. All right, so my, another question is, uh, what is the nearest relative, living relative of dinosaur? What do you think? Any guess? Monkey! Baka iba yun ah. Mali, pastor. Pag nagtanong, ang nearest na relative ng tao, based on DNA, they said chimpanzee. A dinosaur ito. <laughs> All right. Pero 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 I like your answer Pastor. Ay, kasi yun na to. Uh, I like that one. Ah? <laughs> uh, let's ask the audience. I think they know. All right? Ayan. Oh, so jante ko ulit, Pastor. Oh. <laughs> yes, birds and they said maybe chicken. <laughs> All right. So you have that one. I have still an extra there. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. I hope the, uh, you've gained some info and a little information to share with your students. At this point of time, we will hear an intermission number in a form of duet by Dr. Oliver Pido and Sir Billy Rubino. And every one of them will say, with no exception that they find, Jesus never fails. Even in the days of old, He brought His people through, and then He came to show His love when He died. 
made for me and you And then he gave us again to prove That every story had been true Jesus never fails Jesus never So encouraging to know However deeper in despair That Jesus never fails So what can we do to put you Tell me how can you deny No untold facts, no mysteries It's all so good and dry And a witness of your life, I'll be the first to testify that Jesus never was born in the Republic of Moldova. He studied theology in the different institutions like Adventist Theological Institute in Bucharest, Romania, Adventist University, Zawakski Extension Campus in Russia, Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies in Silangkaveti, Philippines. Our speaker served in several districts and in parallel taught at the Adventist Theological Seminary in Chisinau, Moldova. After his doctoral studies at IAS, he served as a professor of theology in the different districts in the different Adventist universities, such as Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies in Silangkaveti, Philippines, Adventist University of Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Adventist University of Chile, Chilean, Chile. Currently, our speaker and his wife, Diana, served as professors of theology at Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies. Together, they enjoyed the company of their two children, 
Edmond and Edna. Fellow educators, join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Gheorghe Rasmirita, through his online presentation, Intermediary Models of Science, Religion, Dialogue. Let us give him our undivided attention. Uh, in order, in order to, to fit the fossil, fossil record. record. And um, so eventually the elimination of the global flood does not solve any problem that they want to solve. Uh, so this is the first, um, the first intermediary model, progressive creationism. It leans more towards creation, but it compromises a lot with evolutionism and tries to incorporate ideas from evolution like long ages and catastrophes and evil being involved in the, pro in the, pre in the creation um, uh, process. Now let's go to the second and the last model that we are going to look at, uh, the theistic evolutionism. Well, right from the beginning, Charles Darwin was only a core uh, proponent of the uh, theory evolution. The other co-proponent was Alfred Wallace. Now, the difference between Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace is that Charles Darwin tried to describe evolution as totally naturalistic and excluding any divine or supernatural intervention. Now, the co-proponent, or they say co-discoverer, of the theory of evolution um, was Alfred Wallace. Now, Alfred Wallace uh, agreed with many um, uh, aspects of, the, of Darwin's uh, theory, but he could not agree that the universe could have self-generated. He could not agree that life could have self-generated and that humanity could self-generate. So therefore, Wallace posited three divine interventions. He did not believe in the theistic God, in the biblical God, but he believed in a spirit, a universal spirit, a divine transcendent spirit. And he, is, he believed that this divine spirit intervened, intervened um, at three essential moments in the creation of the universe, in the creation of uh, life and in the creation of humanity. With Wallace, we, ha we have started the history of a, the long history of theistic evolutionism. Now, um, what are the uh, tenets, the, the main tenets of theistic evolutionism? Well, theistic evolution says that science and religion are fully compatible. But more than that, Creationism and evolutionism are fully compatible. But this uh, uh, compatibility is not created or generated by um, giving the primacy to scripture, but by giving the primacy to the theory of evolution. So that is why this is called theistic evolution rather than progressive creation, creationism. Let's look at other key concepts of theistic evolutionism. Cosmic evolution, yes, they believed that. Abiogenesis, or the origin of life out of inorganic matter, some theistic evolutionists believe in abiogenesis, while others do not accept abiogenesis. So, generally we have two groups of theistic evolutionism. Evolution is evolution in general. Now, for the theistic evolutionists, evolution itself is God's instrument of creation. So here we can see how they proposed to harmonize creationism and evolutionism. Some, like Wallace and many others, they say, oh, we know how we can integrate the two. Evolution, in fact, is the very instrument God uses to create the universe. So therefore, 
the theistic evolutionists think that evolution that the that nature that the universe has been partially or fully equipped by God to produce the universe, to produce life, to produce humanity. Uh, they all believe in microevolution and they all believe in macroevolution. Uh, although some, uh, some say that macroevolution uh, is not fully um, equipped to produce humanity, but at a particular moment God intervened to infuse a supernatural soul into a developed humanoid to produce the human that has a supernatural soul. Uh, so there are different uh, varieties of theistic evolutionists. So this is also their concept of humanity. Uh, however, even if life emerged in the process of evolution, this does not mean life was produced by chance itself because evolution itself is the divine instrument of creating the universe and life. Uh, <clears throat> when they talk about the Bible, um, they regard the Bible as a religious document, but not necessarily inspired by God literally. Uh, the text in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, was written just as a literary piece, as literature, as poem, uh, as a novel to transmit some uh, moral insights and human insights, but it is not a historical description of a creation. Uh, also, when, um, when they talk about um, creation, as, as I said, uh, they see evolution as an instrument of God to create uh, the, uh, the, the universe, life, and humanity. Evil. According to theistic evolutionism, evil is unavoidable in such a process as evolution. Evolution would necessarily include evil. And if God allowed it, if the evolution is the instrument that God uses to create, um, then we have to just accept it. So, therefore, we cannot say that evil um, was not present before the creation of Adam and Eve, rather evil is part of the creation process through evolution. So, therefore, you don't have a particular concept of the fall. And, therefore, the large part of, or a large part of theistic evolutionist models, they have to radically reinterpret the dynamic history uh, narrated by the Bible. Creation, perfect creation, the fall, uh, the, uh, the coming of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the second coming of Christ in which all things are going to be restored. Uh, this can, doesn't fit into the narrative of theistic evolutionism, so therefore they either have to reinterpret this radically and say that Jesus Christ is a part of evolution or is an accelerated of evolution or comes to give meaning to evolution by suffering with us, by showing God's solidarity with uh, evolutionary suffering. Uh, so we see that this is a radical reinterpretation of the biblical narrative. Or they can appeal to another way. They can say, other theistic evolutionists say, well, we have to keep this biblical dynamic of history, creation, fall, Jesus Christ, salvation, and the second coming of restoration. But how do they do that? They say, evolution was as it was, red in tooth and claw, violence, suffering. But when God created humanity, God infused in the humanity a supernatural soul, and by this God elevated humanity to a perfect state out of which humanity fell, and therefore we need salvation. But by doing that, theistic evolutionism is appealing to a classical Greek, Platonic, pagan concept of dualism, a dualism between body and soul. So, uh, we see that these theistic evolutionists appeal to a non and even anti-biblical concept like dualism in order to salvage 
the rest of the biblical narrative and dynamic of history of salvation. And so uh, let's uh, briefly evaluate uh, theistic evolutionism. First, it does harmonize with the biblical concept that there is a creator who is involved in the creation of the universe. And so they, they, they cannot accept um, the, uh, not the fully naturalistic evolution. They said there is a God who created and intervened at least several times in the process of the development of the universe. The theistic evolutionism also harmonizes with the biblical and scientific claims that there is a beginning of the universe and of life. And so they are very clear about that. Uh, also, it has the merit that it reveals the limitations of natural evolutionism. It says, no, no, we cannot accept evolutionism. Natural evolutionism or uh, reductionist evolutionism uh, is too much of a claim. But it does have challenges, theistic evolutionism. So first, it inherits all the challenges of naturalistic evolutionist, evolutionism that I already have listed above such as the absence of transitional forms of life in the fossil records and the rise of scientific evidence for catastrophism, especially in the second half of the 20th century, uh, abiogenesis, uh, the self-generation of the universe out of nothing, and so on. There are huge problems in evolutionism. So, um, theistic evolutionism inherits all of these challenges. But um, also, uh, theistic evolutionism uh, has the challenge some uh, shares shares in some of the challenges of progressive creationism because it rejects the biblical narrative of creation of the fall and the dynamic of the history of salvation um, it rejects the literalness of uh, of scripture and it rejects the scripture as the authoritative revelation of God as an inspired document and the uh, inspired revelation of God. And so this is a big, big problem and challenge for theistic evolutionism. And also, so I said, some of them, some of the theistic evolutionists, they think that um, uh, they have to alter the Bible and the meaning of the Bible in order to um, make evolutionism and creation compatible and uh, make theistic evolutionism viable. Uh, others use non-biblical and anti-biblical concepts to salvage this, uh, the, the biblical narrative. So we see a huge inconsistency in theistic evolutionism itself and big challenges that they face, uh, which I regard as um, uh, very, I mean, you cannot, impossible to overcome. So, uh, I would like to, to arrive at uh, some conclusions. So, um, models that lean towards evolutionism in our study, that is theistic evolutionism, accept the biblical concept of divine agency in the creation of the universe and life. Thus, on the one hand, they insist that the universe, life, and human consciousness could not have arisen solely on the basis of unguided evolutionary process. God endowed the evolutionary process with the, with the possibilities of producing life or intervened at various crucial points in his development. On the other hand, theistic evolutionism claims to be in, incom in, in complete harmony with the interpretations of naturalistic evolutionism on questions of origins and development of the universe. So in their desire to integrate evolutionary and creationist models, creationist, lean, creationist leaning models such as progressive creationism, uh, strive to maintain some foundational elements of biblical creationism, such as the fact that God is the ultimate creator and that life in its various forms cannot arise out of the evolutionary processes and that need and that needs to be created directly by God. But they are willing to compromise on other features of biblical creationism, such as the authority of the Bible, the age of the earth and life on it, the order of creation, the literalness of the creation account in the book of Genesis, the history, the historicity of Adam and Eve, and the global flood. Instead, these models accept some of the characteristics of evolutionism, such as old age on the, of the earth and life on it. 
the existence of predation and violence and evil as part of the creation process. It is true that these intermediary modules claim to solve some problems of evolutionism, such as evidence of a beginning of the universe ex nihilo, design, uh, the emergence of life and human consciousness. But they don't help resolve other scientific questions such as the evidence for rapid sedimentation and or global catastrophism. On the biblical part, they compromise the fundamental biblical teachings such as the authority of the Bible, origin of evil, suffering and death, the character, justice and love of God, the meaning of the incarnation, death and resurrection of Christ, future salvation and restoration of the world to its original plan. In a final analysis, creationist leaning intermediary models do not differ essentially from the evolutionary leaning models such as theistic evolutionism. At any given time, the difference between progressive creationism and theistic evolutionism is in degree and not in kind. While progressive creationism reserves more rooms for direct divine interventionism and less for evolution, Theistic evolutionism allows more room for evolution while divine intervention is hidden in the evolutionary process itself. So the creationist model um, is, a, in my analysis, the closest model to a direct and natural reading of the Bible. It recognizes God as the ultimate creator of the universe and of life, who created everything personally and directly, giving them their own destiny, purpose and meaning. Thus, creationism is in complete harmony with the biblical narrative and concepts such as creation ex nihilo, the origin of life, the origin of human consciousness, the historicity and literalness of the week of the creation of Adam and Eve, the fall and the global flood, the need for the salvation in Christ, the explanation of the just and loving character of God and the future a salvation and restoration of all things. But this model is also compatible with the scientific observations such as evidence for design and global catastrophism. On the other hand, it has solutions for such scientific challenges as the origin of the universe, of the earth, of life, and the lack of transitional forms in the fossil record. Yes, uh, creationism still faces several challenges such as, um, such as some problems with the fossil record or with radiometric uh, dating, which suggests an old age. So in light of this analysis and evaluation, this presentation concludes that the model that best harmonizes with the revealed biblical information, but also with scientific evidence, is the creationist model. This model proposes a viable approach to the in interaction between science and religion, without the need to integrate the concept of evolution in the sense of macroevolution of the naturalistic evolutionary model, which causes irreconcilable tensions and problems with both the scientific evidence and biblical information. This demonstrates that while science and religion can interact efficiently, the creationist and natural ev naturalistic evolutionist models cannot be integrated. Yes, science and religion, yes, but not creation and evolution. They cannot be integrated. Therefore, neither the models of creationist tendency nor the models, sorry, neither the models that lean towards creationism nor the models that lean towards evolutionism cannot be considered as viable models, as uh, 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 models that reconcile uh, creation and science. Although, the, uh, although creationist models find that the concepts of divine creation and naturalistic evolution are mutually exclusive, this model is the most valid model for science and religion interaction. Again, it harmonizes best with both the biblical information and the scientific evidence. Far from precluding science or reinterpreting the Bible, this model promotes an adequate respect for both the Bible and for the scientific process as an endeavor to know the truth. It does not have negative consequences neither for the biblical theology nor for the science. 
On the contrary, it has the least number of contradictions and nu numerous solutions to issues in science and religion. Although some scientific challenges persist, these challenges are rather technical in nature and this model expects that these will be solved with future scientific research and findings. This is my conclusion. Thank you so much for your attention and God bless you in your teaching, in your activity and may we be a shining point, a shining uh, and, um, source of the truth in this world. Thank you for your attention. God bless you in everything. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Pakiwave nga yung hands kung gising pa tayo, baka ang iba natutulog na. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this afternoon, I will be presenting to you a part of my study which I conducted at the University of Santo Tomas during my PhD. Uh, there are two phases of the study, and I'm presenting to you the first phase only. Because the second phase, um, it might take time, and it's more on bacterial transformation. So, transforming the resistant strains to sensitive strains after isolate, isolating the DNA of the resistant strains and both the sensitive strains. So I'll just give to you the first part. And before that, I'd like to thank my husband for patiently carrying, bringing the stool samples to the lab where I did my study. Okay?
Okay. The title, I have entitled the first part, Occurrence of Drug Resistance in E. coli Among Vegetarians and Non-Vegetarians, A Confirmation of God's Prescribed Original Diet. I don't need to ask you what is God's prescribed original diet. And you will, I know all of you have read it already and we'll just try to confirm through the study that I will be presenting you this afternoon. And to start with, I'll give you a short introduction on how the study was conceptualized. Antimicrobial drugs have played a very important role in the treatment and control of bacterial infections, right? How many of you have never used an antibiotic when you had bacterial infections? Can you raise your hand? Sinong hindi nakapaggamit na ng antibiotic sa buo nilang buhay pag nagkakabacterial infection? I'm sure wala, no? Tayo naka-experience na talaga, okay? So, that is it. Moreover, antibiotics are given to animals to treat and prevent disease. Also, low concentrations are given to promote their growth. Sino sa inyo ang nagkakaroon ng 45 days uh, na mga poultry? Nagpapabuano ng mga 40, 45 days na mga chickens? Wala. Very good. One of the persisting controversies about these practices is whether bacteria become resistant to antibiotics by being exposed to these drugs and eventually can spread to human beings. Antimicrobial resistance is one of the most serious global public health threats in this century. The first World Health Organization global report on surveillance of antimicrobial resistance published in April 2014, collected for the first time data from national and international surveillance networks showing the extent of this phenomenon in many parts of the world and also the presence of large gaps in the existing surveillance. The U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimated more than 2 million people every year affected with antibiotic-resistant infections, with at least 23,000 dying as a result of the infection. According to Elash, in 1996, bacterial resistance to antimicrobial agents was recognized as a problem since the advent of chemotherapy. Moreover, its indiscriminate use in an animal husbandry to stimulate growth and as a supplement in animal feeds has also contributed to the development of bacterial strains resistant to these drugs in man. According to Fry in 1978, it was observed that the extensive use of antimicrobial drugs in the hospitals and in the community has sped up the selection of pathogens which are now at present resistant to many antibiotics. Not only the overuse of antibiotics, but also its inappropriate use. When we say inappropriate use, it means the inappropriate choice of the drug, inadequate dosing, poor adherence to treatment guidelines. These are considered as inappropriate use of the drugs. And all of these contribute to the increase of antibiotic resistance. And it was also observed that these drug-resistant microorganisms can be transferred to man directly through the handling of these animals treated with antibiotic-supplemented feeds or through the butcher shop, that is, through eating their flesh. A substantial proportion of total antibiotic use occurs outside the field of human medicine. Antimicrobial use in food producing animals and in aquaculture for growth promotion and for disease treatment or prevention is a major contributor to the overall problem of resistance. I have there the literature. This is just a part of the literature cited. 
the widespread use of antimicrobial agents in food animal production for growth in promotion, prophylaxis or treatment purposes has contributed to the spread of antibiotic resistance. Not only being resistant to one drug, but it's multi-drug resistance. So, multi-drug resistance to different commonly used antimicrobial agents such as ampicillin, chloramphenicol, sulfonamides, and tetracyclines is frequent. It has been associated with a higher risk of invasive infections, higher frequency and duration of hospitalization, and increased risk of death as compared to infections caused by susceptible strains. A, Europe, a European surveillance of veterinary antimicrobial consumption that includes data from 26 countries showed that sales of antibiotics for use, therapy, or prophylaxis in food-producing animals during 2012 amounted to 8,000 tons of active ingredients with tetracyclines, penicillins, and sulfonamides being the most sold antimicrobial classes. And in the U.S. in 2012, sales of antimicrobial drugs approved for use in food-producing animals was around 14,800 tons. And tetracyclines represented the most sold antimicrobial class. Okay? Now, the use of antibiotics in agriculture is a controversial practice. The concern that antibiotic use in agriculture increases the frequency of antibiotic-resistant genes in bacteria living on plant surfaces and that genes conferring resistance might then be transferred into clinically important bacteria has resulted in higher restrictions on the use of antibiotics in plant agriculture in Europe and in the U.S. So, what then is the problem that was posed in this study? Microorganisms are now resistant to each new antimicrobial agent being discovered. The large and widespread use of antibiotics is believed to cause drug resistance in bacteria. And this practice has been challenged by scientists for fear of the consequences that are now existing and soon to exist because normally sensitive bacteria have now become resistant to bacteria. So, Antibiotic resistance occurs when bacteria change and can fight off the antibiotic medicines that typically kill them. And antibiotic resistance leads to higher medical costs, prolonged hospital stays, and increased mortality. The world urgently needs to change the way it prescribes and uses antibiotics. Even if new medicines are developed, Without behavior chains, antibiotic resistance will remain a major threat. So this is one of the focus of the study for a major behavior chains. Antibiotic resistance greatly limits tri treatment options. And some strains of bacteria are now considered as superbugs, which means they don't respond to several different antibiotics anymore. And in addition, not only for the use of antibiotics, but... In addition, animals and their bacterial flora that were not yet exposed to these drugs become potential sources of new resistant strains when given feeds enriched with these drugs. And men's proximity and association with these domesticated animals increase the possibility of obtaining greater number of resistant bacteria. The ingestion, therefore, of these domesticated animals could increase the occurrence of resistant strains of bacteria in man and had seriously reduced the therapeutic value of many important antibiotics. So this study attempted to answer several research questions, the first one of which would be the frequency of the presence of drug-resistant strains in vegetarians and non-vegetarians, and the rest of the questions would ask 
uh, if the differences between the resistant and sensitive strains of E. coli among vegetarians and non-vegetarians would be uh, significantly different. And of course, the interaction to find out if there is a significant difference in the interaction between diet, vegetarianism or non-vegetarianism, and exposure to medication or exposure to anti antibiotics. And of course, and the last one is to find out whether there is a significant relationship between diet and exposure to the drugs. No, the four, uh, the four test antibiotics which I have used, no, which I will mention later. And of course, this, this uh, study attempted to test the different null hypotheses on the inferential questions that were posed. And for the scope of the study, this study was confined to the analysis of the occurrence of drug resistant strains of E. coli among the vegetarians and non vegetarians, sectarian, and they were all found in Silang Cavite. Uh, the antibiotics that were used for this test were uh, amoxicillin, uh, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, and cotrimoxazole. Now, why have I chosen this for antibiotics? Because as mentioned in literature, these are the most common antibiotics which are being incorporated in animal feeds and some, most of these antibiotics are also, are also used by human beings. This is the model that I followed in the conduct of the study. There are four factors involved in the emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance. The first one there, which is at the bottom, no? is antibiotics use and other factors in the hospital. In other words, human medicine in the hospital. And then we have the second one, uh, human medicine in the community. That is on, uh, on this wala kong pointer eh. On the other side, no? antibiotics use and other factors in the community. We have also presence of resistant bacteria in the environment. And last but not the least, antibiotic use in food producing animals and in agriculture. The study that I conducted did not involve all the four factors. It only involved the two, uh, human medicine in the hospital or antibiotics and other factors in the hospitals. And the second one is antibiotic use in food producing animals and in agriculture. So with these two factors that I got in the conduct of my study, I was able to develop this model. Okay, I'm not sure, clear by Jan. Okay, so on the animal side, you have their conditioned feeds and direct medication to animals. Uh, so when conditioned feeds or direct medication would be given to animals, bacteria in animals would form resistant strains. And on the other side, you have on the human part, through ingestion of this or even through medication, no? ingestion of the live organism or the dead organism. The live organisms may multiply in humans and cause infection, or the dead organisms may even cause other bacteria in men also to, cause, to form resistant strains and cause infection. Uh, direct medication in man may also cause other bacteria in man to cause or form resistant strains would multiply and cause infection. Okay, what is the principle behind? It is because of genetic transfer. And genetic transfer may be done through transformation, transduction, conjugation, plasmids, transposons, or chromosomes. But what I did in the second phase of my study is transformation. Genetic transfer causing transformation among bacteria. But that is not the focus of my presentation this morning. It's more on just trying to find out differences in the currency of resistance strains. What makes the difference between being a vegetarian and a non-vegetarian? Okay? The research method used in this study, of course, was experimental. It was quantitative experimental in design. And the criteria used in the isolation of the E. coli, because I isolated the E. coli from the stool samples of vegetarians and non-vegetarians. So um, 
We had several, I used several criteria. Uh, of course, it's more on morphology and staining. Uh, of um, E. coli are in the bacilli form, they are gram negative. Uh, the cultural characteristics also, they were cultured in, of course, EMB agar. No? And uh, also the biochemical characteristics were uh, taken. The sources of the bacterial isolates were st uh, stool samples were taken from two different test populations. So there were 30 vegetarians and 30 non-vegetarians, okay? A total of 60. However, of the 60 uh, sample, samples that were taken, only 53 were considered in the study because um, only 53 bacterial isolates were taken because um, seven bacterial isolates did not show resistance to the different antibiotics that were used. And of course, since this involved human subjects, ethical considerations were taken, uh, were, uh, what do you call this, practiced. And of course, anonymity and confidentiality were, were observed. In the selection of the population, a survey form was conducted so to find out uh, who were the vegetarians. For the non-vegetarians, there was no more survey because, of course, if they, are, they don't belong to the vegetarians, then basically they are non-vegetarians. And so the sampling procedures that were used would be uh, convenience sampling to select the non-vegetarians' convenience and for the vegetarians' purposive sampling. Uh, when it was purposive sampling, in other words, there was a certain criteria that were considered. And one of those, of course, would be they were already vegetarians for the past six months. Okay? Um, Isolation and identification of the bacterial isolates. The inoculum was strict and cultured in using methylene blue agar. They were identified using the different biochemical tests, the IMVIC procedure, and then the gram staining reaction. And antibiotic sensitivity testing was uh, done through the MH agar or the Mueller Hinton agar, and they were placed with eight antibiotic discs per agar plate. And of course, I have mentioned already the four test antibiotics. The zones, the zones of inhibition were measured in terms of millimeters. The zones of inhibition are the indicators whether the microorganisms would be resistant or sensitive. Results were in the, interpreted according to the zone diameter interpretation standards secured from the Adventist Medical Center Manila Laboratory. For the analysis of the data, descriptive statistics of frequency, percentage, and mean were used for the uh, frequency of occurrences. Chi-square chi test for the significant differences. Two-way ANOVA for the interaction of the variables. Uh, there were two variables, diet and exposure to medication. And relationships were tested using the correlation coefficient and the degree of relationship was uh, measured using the simple regression analysis. The flow chart in the isolation, of course, the source of the specimen, isolation and identification, then we have the antibiotic sensitivity testing. Okay, for the results, we have here the frequency of vegetarians and non-vegetarians, and you will notice that there were six of the resistance strains. By the way, all of these are under resistance strains, no? But we have the resistant, the intermediate, and the partial. We are on the resistance strains. So six vegetarians and six for the non-vegetarians. Tetracycline, five for vegetarians and seven for non-vegetarians. For chloramphenicol, zero for vegetarians. Three for the non-vegetarians. Cotrimoxazol, uh, Two for vegetarians and eight for the non-vegetarians. Okay, so if you put it in a graph, it would look like this. So by just looking at the graph, you will now see which ones have more of resistant strains. Okay, for amoxicillin, they have the same, right? For tetracycline, lower, vegetarians. And then non-vegetarians, you have more. For chloramphenicol, bakante ang vegetarians. For cotrimoxazole, you have more for the non-vegetarians. This is the graphic part. 
Okay? So in this, we can say that there is a trend of developing drug resistance among the samples. And uh, however, there is also a trend of differed. Now, if you look at it here, the vegetarians have lesser uh, resistance strains. So there is a trend of deferred or possibly delayed resistance or no resistance at all that was observed among the vegetarians as compared to the non-vegetarians. And looking at the chart there, you will see that both groups are equally exposed. In the survey that was done, both groups are equally exposed to the same drug which by medication, that is amoxicillin. So you will see here that the samples have exhibited similar susceptibility to amoxicillin as presented in the graph. So they have the same number. So the trend in resistance strains being present among the samples only shows that people are harboring drug resistance strains of microorganisms that could impede proper medication in case infectious disease starts. Okay? The greater number of resistance strains among non-vegetarians over vegetarians could be possibly attributed to exposure of non-vegetarians to poultry and meat products that were conditioned with drug resistance strains. The result of the study positively favors vegetarian diet as the least prone to the development of drug-resistant microorganisms considering that the frequency of the occurrences of vegetarians have Dr uh, having drug resistance strains of E. coli is lesser than that of the non vegetarians. Okay? Now, is the difference significant? If you look at it here, uh, at the chi square computed, you will see that cotrimoxazole is significant. For amoxicillin and tetracycline, hindi yan significant. Okay? So, if you look at the significance, here, you will see, as the number shows there, you will see that uh, the significance um, is only for cotrimoxazole. Okay? So, five vegetarians, seven non-vegetarians for tetracycline, cotrimoxazole 2 and 8. So, the difference in cotrimoxazole is significant. So, when you say it's significant, then you are, uh, I'm rejecting the null hypothesis which say, that there is no significant difference. So when there is no significant difference, it says then that the difference between cotrimoxazole and uh, between vegetarians and non-vegetarians in cotrimoxazole is really significant. There's a difference. Okay? Um, then, uh, how about for taken as a whole? The drug, and the drug and sensitive resistance strains of E. coli, regardless of their diet, Okay, it's found out that amoxicillin, chloramphenicol, and cotrimoxazole are all significant except for tetracycline. And I'm sure you know that tetracycline is the most commonly used drug. Five minutes na lang? <laughs> anyway, I'll just read it fast. Okay, so significant difference. Um, how about the difference between drug-resistant and sensitive strains among vegetarians only. Vegetarians lang muna. Okay? Is the difference between the resistant and sensitive strain significant? You will notice here that um, chloramphenicol is not included. Why? Uh, at, in, the first present, in the first slide, I mean, in the first slide in the results and discussion, you will, you will remember that chloramphenicol um, vegetarians did not show resistance strains in chloramphenicol. That's why it's not included in, in the, in the chi-square test anymore. So looking at the results here, you will see that tetracycline is not significant. Only amoxicillin and cotrimoxazole. Okay? Again, it only shows that there's a difference between the number of drug resistance strains of E. coli among the vegetarians. Okay, that's the graph. How about for the non-vegetarians? Okay, for the non-vegetarians, we have amoxicillin, tetracycline, and chloramphenicol, which tend to be significant. So, 
There is a significant difference in the currents of drug resistant and sensitive strains of the E. coli among vegetarians and non vegetarians. Okay? Non vegetarians having resistant strains for tetracycline and cotrimoxazole is higher as compared to the vegetarians. Resistant strains were also present for chloramphenicol among non-vegetarians and none for the vegetarians. Resistance observed among both groups was possibly affected by diet. Vegetarians were more sensitive to the test antibiotics, whereas non-vegetarians developed resistance to amoxicillin, tetracycline, and chloramphenicol. Results plainly indicate that although there is a trend towards the development of drug resistance among both vegetarians, among both groups, vegetarians had an edge over the non-vegetarians with a ratio of 2 is to 3. Therefore, vegetarians will respond more to the test antibiotics than the non-vegetarians in cases of infection. Hence, food habits may have possibly affected the development of E. coli becoming more resistant to certain antibiotics to a certain extent. Okay, this one now, the next variable here is the exposure to, to drugs. And the drug that is only included in the computation or in the test is amoxicillin because it's on, uh, it is, this is the only drug wherein uh, the samples were exposed to. Okay, so... Vegetarians, there were three. Non-vegetarians, two. Okay? So, that would be the, the difference. So, you can see it here. There were more vegetarians who were exposed to the antibiotic than the non-vegetarians. Okay? So, if you take a look at it here, uh, it shows that most of the prescribed drug of the four test antibiotics is amoxicillin. And chi-square chi test on the effect of amoxicillin among vegetarians and non-vegetarians in drug resistance development showed a non-significant difference, hence uh, the null hypothesis is retained. Okay, so the non-significant difference between the two groups shows that both groups were equally affected. It also shows that the samples studied were already resistant to amoxicillin regardless of their diet, hence resistance may be attributed to prescription. In the two groups, therefore, amoxicillin may not be effective or recommendable for prescription considering that the samples have shown resistance to this antibiotic. The trend in this study has shown that men's food habit and direct exposure to drugs hasten the development of drug resistance as shown in the first and the second uh, research questions. Okay, then we come to the zones of inhibitions that were produced by the E. coli in the presence of the antibiotic discs between the vegetarians and the non-vegetarians. Uh, they were measured in terms of millimeter and you will notice that the higher the measurement, the more sensitive the microorganism is. Okay, so the higher the measurement in the zone of inhibition, you will say that the microorganism is more sensitive. So looking at the chart here, it, uh, you will see that non-vegetarian measurement. 